Chapter Five of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter Five. When the blow fell. Oh, Grace, Arlene Thayer, is it possible? Cried Grace. Yes, but that is not all. Look behind you. Directed Arlene. Grace's face flushed as her eyes met the smiling faces of Anne Pearson, Mabel Ash, and Ruth Denton. There were little exclamations of delight from each. "'And you girls never said a word to me about it,' chided Grace. "'We wished to surprise you,' said Arlene. "'So we requested Professor Morton not to tell you that we were going.' We have been here ever since headquarters opened this morning, coming straight here to the Red Cross offices from our trains. There are a number of others from Overton who are to be here, some of whom I do not think you know. What makes you so late? The orders said any time before noon. It is not yet noon. I had a few errands to do and some money to exchange, which I thought best to attend to, not knowing whether we were to set sail today or not. Not until ten o'clock tomorrow morning, dear, Anne Pearson informed her. We sail on the SS Holborn, and if the good ship doesn't sink, it will be the first time that something dreadful did not happen when Grace Harlowe was at hand. Remember, Anne, I am no longer Grace Harlowe. I am Grace Grey. My unlucky luck has changed, so you are perfectly safe in sailing with me. To whom do we report here? To Mr. Conway, who has charge of the college units going over. Arlene will take you in and introduce you. Then Mr. Conway will take your pedigree and your fingerprints, etc. Arlene is our self-appointed mouthpiece, or has been. Now that Grace Harlowe has arrived, I reckon she will be the leading spirit of this outfit. I cheerfully resign in her favour, spoke up Arlene. If you are ready, we will go in, Grace. Mr. Conway greeted Grace cordially, taking her in in one appraising glance. I have a most cordial letter from President Morton regarding you, Mrs. Gray, he said. In view of what the President of Overton has written, I have decided to place you in charge of the unit on the voyage. Of course, when you reach France, that arrangement is subject to change. Here is your passport. Have you a recent photograph of yourself? I have brought two for the purpose, Grace informed him, handing over the photographs. I see you come forearmed, smiled Mr. Conway. I will take you to the wardrobe director who will fit you out with uniforms, which will be ready for you late this afternoon. Your luggage must be on board ship tonight. At four this afternoon you will report here for such instructions as I have to give you regarding your unit en route. May I ask what our assignments are to be overseas? That will depend upon what the individual is best fitted for, and what the director in Paris may decide to give you. It is not probable that the unit will operate in France as a unit, however. So I have been given to understand. Your party must be on board not later than nine o'clock in the morning. Please inform each person individually. That will be all for the present. I am glad to know you, Mrs. Gray, and am certain that you and your unit will do most excellent work in France. It is such material as this unit is made up of that we are in search of. The wardrobe director, a motherly-faced woman, grey-haired and kindly, fitted two uniforms to Grace. There were some alterations to be made, but she informed Grace that the uniforms would be ready by three o'clock that afternoon. Grace and her old friends then went out to luncheon together, where they discussed their voyage and the work that lay ahead of them in France. By the way, Arlene, I forgot to tell you that Mr. Conway has appointed a more competent person for your job. I am to be in charge of the unit on the way over. Sorry, but merit always wins. Not at all. I suggested that you were the proper person, nor do I envy your job. Deliver me from having the responsibility of looking out for a shipload of seasick girls. I say I suggested you as the leader. I did, but Mr. Conway said that he already had you in mind. It seems that someone had written to him about you. Grace Harlowe, 
Have you been playing politics, pulling wires to get yourself into a good job? I deny the allegation, replied Grace laughingly. If my recollection serves me right, Mrs. Gray was something of a politician when she first came to Overton, interjected Mabel. She was. She got herself elected to pretty nearly everything in sight, declared Ruth. Grace laughed merrily. We might as well laugh while we still have laughs left in us, Grace said. Soon, I fear, we shall not be laughing. I know that what I shall see in France will give me a heartache that I shall not get over for many a long day. Come, girls, I suggest that we return to headquarters and see what we can pick up in the way of information. According to arrangement, Mr. Conway made a long talk to the unit, after which he gave Grace detailed instructions as to the regulations which would apply to her unit on the voyage. Remember, was his parting injunction, that the moment you set foot on the deck of the Holborn, you become a part of the forces of the United States and subject to all the rules and regulations of the military establishment. An hour later, Grace Harlow Gray put on her uniform, the natty blue of the overseas units, the collar bearing the insignia USA. A dark blue felt hat completed the outfit. The spare uniform was packed in the regulation trunk, together with such other belongings as she was permitted to take with her. The others of the merit did likewise, and their trunks were carried away to the ship. Grace gave her final instructions to her party before they left headquarters for the night. The pier and the ship were surging masses of khaki when Grace reached there next morning. Men were surging up the gangway, bent over under their heavy equipment. Orders were being shouted everywhere. It was a scene of confusion such as she had never witnessed, but this was war, as Grace Grey realised when she gazed at the long slender guns mounted fore and aft and to starboard and port on the upper deck of the ship. "'If one of those things goes off while I am on this ship, I know I shall jump overboard,' declared Anne Pearson. "'You will do nothing so foolish,' rebuked Grace. "'Remember, I am responsible for your well-being on this voyage.' After you reach France, you may jump overboard as many times as pleases your fancy. My responsibility ends the moment the ship is tied up to her pier over there. After all the members of the unit had reported to her, Grace assigned them to their quarters, of which she had a list supplied by Mr. Conway. The unit's quarters were on the upper deck, where the officers were quartered, and to accommodate all of the young women, even majors were obliged to sleep for in a cabin. The Overton girls were packed into their cabins in the same proportion, four in a room. That evening there was a dance on the upper deck, a dance from which the privates down on the well deck and in the hold were barred. Grace was kept fully occupied in attending to her charges and dancing with the officers, among whom she was the most popular person on the ship before that evening's entertainment was ended. It was to be the last night of dancing, for, after that first evening, no lights were to be permitted on board, save the dim green corridor lights. There was, however, no objection to their dancing in the daytime. Colonel Ward was the commander of the regiment on board, and Grace, at the first opportunity, made his acquaintance, and from him obtained permission to arrange for a dance for the men of the regiment and the sailors after mess that afternoon. Permission was readily granted, and the Overton units won the hearts of the regiment, and incidentally nearly danced their shoes from their feet in trying to dance with every man on board. It was too big a contract for even an Overton unit, and when the dancing came to an end on account of darkness, there were about two thousand men still waiting to dance with a little group of tired but bright-eyed young women. Grace promised them that they should have their dance at another time if she should catch the colonel in a good humour. By the following morning several ships had joined the convoy, having three destroyers with them, one on either side and the third one some distance ahead of the convoy. Watches were stationed at many places on the deck and in the crow's nest where there always was a double watch, two men instead of one as is the custom in peace times. The sea was smooth and there was little wind, though the ship rolled quite heavily at times. 
Anne Pearson of Grace's set was the only one who was seasick and she required the services of the regimental surgeon. Grace spent considerable time among the men with whom she grew more popular with the hours. She chatted with them and wrote letters home for those who were ill, filling up each hour with useful work and impressing certain members of her unit into the work as well. Colonel Ward congratulated her. You were doing more than you realised to make the men contented. Their morale is splendid when you consider that the majority of these men have never been a day's ride from their own homes before leaving for their mobilisation camp. Should we have the misfortune to get mixed up with an undersea boat, I think you will find that they will give a good account of themselves. The credit for this will in no small measure be due to the work of your unit. May I ask when you plan giving the men another dance? Now, if it suits your pleasure, Colonel. You may call on the Overton girls at any time, day or night, for any service they are able to render. We are going over for service, sir. What better service can we give them by making the way a little easier for the men who are offering their lives for us? I am afraid I have expressed myself badly, but I think you will understand the deep-seated motive that has led these young women of Overton to join this unit? I do understand, my dear lady. You are Americans. That is all that is necessary to be said of your motives. Let me see. It is now six bells, eleven o'clock. Mess will be over at about one thirty. Say we call the dance for two o'clock? Thank you. I will have the girls of my outfit at hand. Might I suggest, Colonel, that you ask some of those YMCA girl war workers to join us in dancing with the men? Thus far they seem to have nothing to do but parade the promenade deck with your most estimable young officers. Not that I blame them, Colonel, but the need, it seems to me, is for them below decks. The Colonel laughed heartily. You are right, Mrs. Gray. I'll see what I can do. The result of what I can do was three Y girls, making a party of a total of twenty-three, including the Overton unit, for the dance, and being still too ill to dance. A piano and two banjos supplied the music. The men were not informed of what was in store for them until the music struck up and the Overton unit ran laughing down to the well deck. "'Here we are, buddies. Choose your partners, but do not keep them for too long.' called Grace. The men uttered a cheer, and Colonel Ward, standing at the rail of the promenade deck, looking down on the scene, chuckled approvingly. "'There's a young woman worth while,' said the Colonel, turning to one of his captains, who had come up with others to watch the dancing below. "'Who is she?' "'Mrs. Grace Gray is her name. I believe her husband is in the service. She is in charge of the Overton College unit, and every one of that unit is of the same type, intelligent, cultured, and Americans to the marrow. I see only three of the Y girls down here. I suppose the others are entertaining our young lieutenants up on the boat deck. The captain shrugged his shoulders. They are not quite in the same class with these young women, I should say, by which remark I mean no disparagement to the YMCA workers, many of whom are doing good work in France, I am told. Be good sports now and give the boys who failed to find a partner the last time a chance to dance now. That's right, don't be backward, urged Grace. A space had been cleared immediately upon the arrival of the girls, and ere she had finished speaking a big doughboy had grabbed Grace and stepped off in a lively foxtrot. I'll take the next one before I give you up, announced the doughboy with some emphasis. Oh, no. Look at those poor fellows washing us. Have a heart, buddy, she protested. All right, I'll give you up, but I don't want to, he agreed with a sigh of resignation that caused Grace to laugh merrily. Leaving her partner, Grace made straight for a young soldier whom she had been observing as she danced. He was very young, but big of frame, and probably had been a farm boy before going into the service. It was the lonely, hungry look on his face that attracted her attention, and she determined to shake him up. "'Come along, buddy. This is our dance,' she cried cheerily, lifting an arm to be swung into the next dance. The boy blushed until his face was rosy red. 
I'm... I'm afraid I can't, miss, he stammered. I'm clumsy as an off-ox, and my shoes are big, and... and I don't know how to dance very well. Nonsense! You come along. I've got a big boy like you in the service, too. And I should thank some nice girl if she asked him to dance with her. You... you have a boy, uh... He's my husband, buddy, and I am used to having him step on my toes. Dancing is not one of his accomplishments. The doughboy, without further opposition, swung Grace out to the open deck and they began their dance. She found him more diffident than awkward, and after a few moments he danced very well indeed. You are homesick today, aren't you? she demanded. Well, yes, I guess I am a little, he admitted. I thought so. You will forget all that after you get to beautiful France. What is your name? Jonas Bartles. I live on a farm in Pennsylvania. Well, don't get homesick any more, or I shall have to come down and cheer you up. Now I must hunt up some other homesick boy and give him a dance. Grace gave Jonas a winning smile and a warm hand clasp, and in a few seconds had chosen another lonely soldier boy for a partner. As she passed the members of her unit in the dance, she called them to pick out the boys who needed cheering up. "'They all do,' answered Arlene Thayer. No twenty-three girls ever worked harder than the Overton girls did that day, and after half an hour every one of them was at the point of exhaustion, as Grace saw, but all were smiling, wholeheartedly hiding their weariness from the eager doughboys. "'When you ladies get tired, let me know and we will stop the party.' was the message the colonel sent down by an orderly. "'Tell the colonel we haven't yet begun,' was the word Grace returned to the commanding officer. A sudden crash from one of the three-inch guns on the upper deck shook the ship, and the music stopped instantly. The first shot was followed by a second, and then a third. "'Go on, music. They're only trying out their guns,' called Grace. "'Play. On with the dance.' Grace, however, knew very well that it was not a mere try-out, for she had seen some officers running to their stations. The musicians, taking their cue from her, resumed their playing, and the doughboys began to dance again, though those who were not dancing peered over the bullocks to learn what the guns were shooting at. What they saw appeared to interest them very much, but they were game and did not raise their voices to alarm the dancers. Guns now began to fire from other ships of the convoy. The dancers could hear them above the music of the pianos and the banjos. Meanwhile, the guns of the Holborn were firing rapidly. Suddenly there was a jolt that made the big ship tremble. She seemed to pause in her rapid flight and then stagger on like a wounded thing, following the explosion that came immediately after the jolt. It was not a deafening explosion, but a muffled, far-away roar. I reckon it is time to stop. Grace confided to her dancing partner. "'Yes, we are struck,' he answered. The big siren of the steamer began to blare the call to quarters. Officers on deck were shouting out orders, and it seemed as though all were in confusion on the upper decks. It was confusion, but orderly confusion, as it were. Grace's girls hurried to her side. "'Go immediately to our boat and await orders.' she directed. Let the boys up first. The boys would have none of it. One by one they boosted the Overton girls up to the promenade deck, cheering as they did so. Are we in a serious condition, Colonel? questioned Grace calmly as they passed Colonel Ward. The ship is sinking, was the brief reply. She will be down in ten minutes. End of chapter 5 Recording by Ashley Jane